Hey guys, welcome to a film darkly. So today I wanted to pull out an older film, a much older film that came out in the 60s um, called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Um, it's available to stream right now on Prime. Uh, so I went ahead and checked it out and uh, decided to watch it today. And you know, for me, when I watch this movie, it really takes me it, it really takes me back. And the reason it takes me back is because it was one of my dad's favorite movies. So we actually had it um, on VHS. And it came in two tapes, if I remember right. It came in two VHS tapes. Because, you know, any movie that was pretty much over an hour and a half had intermissions and was like cut in half and thing. I mean, I remember going to see Ghostbusters 2 in the movie theaters and there being an intermission. And I think that's like an hour and 40 something minute movie. Um, not even two hours. But I remember distinctly there being an intermission. It used to be a thing to have intermissions. Or or an over... I think the other word was an, an overturn. Overturn. Something like that. Um, and nowadays, of course, you know, Avengers Endgame, they expect you to sit there for three nearly three and a half hours or three hours you know lord of the rings expect you to sit there for three hours and just you know that's just the way it is you don't have a an intermission i think um the last movie i could ever remember watching that had an intermission i think was titanic um i'm pretty sure it was titanic because titanic is pretty long i mean it, it, it that was another movie that actually came out on uh, vhs with two tapes um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it had an intermission, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, I just decided to go ahead and sit down and watch one of my favorite movies of all time, a movie that, um, always just stuck out to me. And, um, it was really interesting sitting down and watching this film because I had never realized the subtext of the movie. And it, you know, if you, if you don't know, it's directed by uh, Sergio Leone. It um, has a a score by um, Anicio. I always forget how to say his last name. See if I can even find it. Um, see, I don't know if I can say it right. I know it's it's Ennio Morricone. I think it's how you say it. It's Italian. He's, he's very well known for the ecstasy of gold, which comes from this film. Um, but but interestingly enough, like this movie, it, you know, it stars Clint Eastwood as... They, he's called Blondie by Tuco, but he's actually kind of the man with no name. And then you have uh, Lee, Lee Van Cleef, who plays Angel Eyes, or uh, another name for him is Senten, Sentenza. So, sen, I don't know how to say it. And then you have uh, Eli uh, Wallach, I think is how you say his last name, as, as Tuchel. And uh, Tuchel is, you know, the ugly. And then you have, you know, the bad and you have the good. Uh, Clint Eastwood being the good and uh, Angel Eyes being the bad. Um, I know him mostly as Angel Eyes because they kind of call him Angel Eyes throughout the film. So anyways, um, it, it's, a, it's a great movie. It has a lot of fantastic moments. Where the director really lets the scene breathe. Um, case in point would be the very opening scene of the film. You're kind of just getting this sort of... Um, um, how can I describe it? It's kind of like a planes. A view of a planes with like a... Um, nothing really there. And then all of a sudden this guy steps in the frame. This grizzled, kind of ugly, dirty, sweaty looking guy. And then you see this plane with some buildings and there's a dog running across the street or across the dirt. And in the distance you see two men riding up. And these men are all riding toward each other and they're looking at each other. And it is a very long stretch. Like you go a very long stretch before they bust into this place. You hear several gunshots go off and then Tuco, uh, the ugly jumps out the window and he's got like a chicken in his mouth and like a, a, 
um, like a drink in in his hand and a gun in the other, and uh, then he just you know jumps on a horse and rides while, rides off, um, and you you find out you know that he has a bounty on his head, but then we go over to Angel Eyes and we have this other very breathable scene where we see the outside of this home and there's a lot of dirt and this boy riding a donkey. Uh, it's either, uh, I think it's a donkey or a mule, but it's going in a circle, turning water, and suddenly you see this rider coming up, and as this rider comes up, this dark rider, the kid stops the donkey, jumps off of it, and runs inside. It's angel eyes, and we get this moment where, like, the, you know, the, the, the mother, the wife comes out with food, sets this bowl of food down, this, like, stew, and the husband's right there. He has kind of like a limp, and then you see Angel Eyes at the other doorway. The son doesn't know what's going on and goes to eat, and the mother, like, puts her hands on his shoulders very gently and sort of lets him know, we're not supposed to be in this room right now, and they get up and they walk out. And it's all done with, like, eyes. Like, the, the husband looks at the wife. The wife knows what that means, and, you know, and you have Angel Eyes on the other side, and we still haven't even seen his eyes we don't even know he's angel eyes yet we don't know nothing about him and all of a sudden he you know he kind of walks over very slowly then he sits down well well the guy sits down first then he sits down and then they start eating the stew before they say anything it's one of the the, the most um, you know best scenes ever done and it really the only other director i could think of who does scenes this well where they're long drawn out and they they draw you in and they manage to like have this great dialogue and have eating in between this dialogue is quentin tarantino quentin tarantino really likes his characters to sit down and eat while they talk it happens he, he does that quite a bit it, it's not like super often but it does happen you know like you'll notice it in kill bill when uh, david carradine's character bill is uh, making a sandwich for BB, and then you know gives the sandwich, and they're eating the sandwich sandwiches while they're talking. And you'll notice like there's other scenes like that too, where you'll see people eating a meal as they're talking. You know, as they're they're talking to one another. You know, it's not real common, but you do see it. You know, in in Pulp Fiction, you have the the Big Kahuna burger, and and so that's what Sergio Leone does in this film is he decides. Um, to have this moment where they sit and they talk and so i'm really i'm praising the cinema of this film right now because this is a very classically uh very classical film it's very well done it was originally in italian uh so you'll notice that when you watch the movie like there are almost some characters a lot of characters don't sync very well and it's because they're speaking italian and whereas um you know, you're kind of dubbed with English. And we know most of these actors know English. They speak English perfectly. And they dub themselves most of the time. Um, but there are a lot of characters who you can blatantly tell they're dubbed. Because they're speaking another language. And they're all speaking Italian. Which is why they're referred to as the Spaghetti Westerns. Um, because they were all filmed in Italy. And um, done in that way. But see, the interesting thing about Good, Bad, and the Ugly is Good, Bad, and the Ugly is about, you know, basically three bandits. They are all bandits. Angel Eyes is a bandit, uh, a, a gun for hire. Uh, Tuco is definitely a bandit. And Blondie's a bit of a bandit, too. I mean, he goes and finds people with warrants on their head. Then he turns them in. Then he then he frees them at the time of, of, of execution and basically takes the money, splits it, and then they go to the next town all the way up until the person's not really worth it anymore and then he kind of lets them go but he usually lets them go in a way where if he's burning them it, it's kind of like they're not going to come after him anymore they're not going to find him with Tuco he makes a mistake because Tuco is a little too ambitious and he's going to go after him but anyhow um you know it all culminates down to this cash box that they're all looking for uh, you know, Bill Carson and his, his 200000 in gold, which is a lot of money back then. I mean, this is like probably millions today. You would be absolutely set for life. You'd be able to give most of it away and be set for life. 
Um, and so the story ends up coming down to uh, Blondie or uh, Clint Eastwood's character and uh, Tuco um, essentially having to team up against Angel Eyes to get the money and then they plan to, you know, kind of split it. Um, but that's not without like a whole lot of backstabbing, a whole lot of fighting going on. Now, the interesting thing about this movie that I noticed was how this film is so like the normal average shoot 'em up movie. It's a gunslinger film. All three of these characters have impeccable aim, and all three of them have incredible luck. Like, incredible luck. Like, they never get hit. They never get shot. They never get hurt, it seems. They can only hurt each other. So it's almost like they're immortal, and they're living out this immortal existence. Whereas the world around them is at war, because it's in the 1800s, and the Civil War is going on. And so they're running into all these young kids who are, like, dying or dead. Um, you know, there's a moment that, that Blondie has with a uh, a guy who's part of the Confederacy who's having a hard time even breathing, is in complete and utter pain. And he, he actually throws his jacket on top of the, the kid and then puts a cigar in his mouth and lets him get it, you know, gets him, lets him smoke a little before he passes away. Um, there, you know, there's a moment where they actually blow up a bridge and they do it for this one, uh, I believe he's a, a sergeant, or a captain actually, they do it for this captain and he smiles right before he passes away because he realizes they, that this bridge that, that had been a pain in his neck had been destroyed. So interestingly enough, like these characters kind of step off into this world of Civil War and see all these interesting things going on, but all the meanwhile, like, you know, their focus is the cash box. But I just kind of, I, I love this analogy. There's this idea, this subtext about how your regular life never really seems to interfere with the world's disasters, with the world's like strife until it hits you at home. And that's the thing I noticed. Like these characters kill people without thinking. They kill people without, without thinking all the time. You know, blast, blast five or six guys and they go down and that's it. But then there's this moment where you see this young kid dying and there's sadness. And it's like, why is there sadness here but not sadness with the other characters? And it's because the expectation is there for those characters to die. The expectation is there for the immortal fantasy world where these guys are untouchable and only the lead villain can kill them. But when it comes to this kid who's a confederate, we don't have the same plan for him. To us, he's just a kid who's dying at war. And that's sad. That's incredibly sad to us. You know, it's sad when you watch the war, when you watch the battle, when you watch the killing. But it's not sad when Tuco grabs Wallace's head and bangs it against a rock and kills him. Why? Because Wallace established himself as a bad guy. And only a good guy can kill him. And even though Tuco's not a good person, Tuco's technically a good guy. You root for Tuco a little. So it's really interesting because I kind of felt like you could very much take this story... Look at the real world and notice how your life is. Your life right now may be interrupted because there's this coronavirus, this uh, COVID-19 going around and we're all having to stay at home. So it's being affected. So you're part of the strife of the world right now. For the first time ever, you're being included in that strife. You're being included in the world's disaster. Usually we're not included in that. We're not. It doesn't mean that you might not be a person where your family member died. But, like, consider somebody who, like, knew someone who was at the Florida club shooting. You know, where, where a gay bar was attacked and 30 people were killed. Think about, like, the, the young children who were killed at Sandy Hook. Or the 12 or so people, I believe it was, that, that were killed uh, in, in Aurora at the movie theater. Like, think about how those people had families and how it may have been happening, it may have happened to them. 
you don't think about it too much. You have to stop to think about it. Because normally your your observe your observation is that's sad. But your your observation is never that's like part of the plan. That's the way it's supposed to go. Because you don't think of yourself that way. You play out like Tuco, Angel Eyes, and Blondie. You live your regular life and live in your regular fantasy world, untouchable in your eyes. The hero who has to make it through the day. Whereas the rest of the world seemingly is in strife. And it isn't until we have moments like today, like now, where we start to realize the strife is so real. That's why if you look on Facebook, you'll notice there's people flipping out. There's people sharing every bit of information they possibly can because they want you to feel like they feel. They want you to take it serious like they're taking it serious. And then you're noticing people that like their reaction is not caring at all. And then there's people who are very moderate. And then you'll have that guy who will come out and like and like announce to the world how he's being so moderate and doesn't care, but then he'll kind of lay it in there how it's very clear he's scared. And it's so interesting how people are like that. It's like I know somebody who likes to write all the time about how they never get involved in politics and how they'll unfriend you if you talk politics. While all the meanwhile giving their opinion on politics without realizing it. Condemning people without realizing it. And it doesn't make any sense to even do that. I had to call out this individual for something uh, the other day because it was quite clear there was an issue there. And so I, I think over and over again, this is what we run into where our worlds are hardly ever tied to the strife of the world, our regular life. And once in a while, it gets tied. And when it does, it's scary. But the thing you have to realize is this is kind of what the world is always like. We just don't notice it until we're pulled into it. You know, I didn't notice the world until my dad was in a hospital bed and gone in a matter of a couple of months. You don't notice the world until the world slaps you in the face and says, here I am. And I'm not saying that the subtext of good, bad, and the ugly is meant to be that. But I'm saying that it's interesting that that film can be broken down that way. And it definitely moves that way. It has a background, a backdrop that transcends the plot and that is such a rarity to find in film today so anyways thanks for listening guys um that's all i have for you today um i'm gonna leave it at that i I meant to do more reviews but i actually started working from home and i have some movie projects going on so everything got tied up i thought being at home hey i'm gonna get to do a thousand audios and just didn't happen um I want to thank Sparkle Sujian uh, from Everything Sparkle for letting me on her uh, or putting me on her show the other day, uh, extending that offer to me, and and getting a little bit of um of some you know publicity, an ability for me to talk about my show, to talk about this podcast, um, and to talk about my short films. Um, you know, uh, she and I are actually very good friends, and I'm just very thankful that she's always so supportive and always there, um, the, you know, there to help me out and there for me um, in, in these times, and um, you know, just really, really helping out with this with with this podcast. And she's been wanting to do this for a while, so it, it's great that it finally got done. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's on my Instagram. Um, you can find me at Anthony Paseno. That's uh, P I S E N O at everything. I mean, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I'm Anthony Paseno. That's just I, I don't I don't make up avatars unless it comes to video games. <laughs> so, anyways, you look me up on there, or you could check out the show Everything Sparkle. Um, I would just watch it in general. It's a it's a nice it's a fun show to watch, and um, you know has a lot of 
variety of topics really a variety of topics which is one of the the, the great things about that show is uh, sparkle's not like afraid to talk about anything you know she has politicians on she has fitness people on she has you know dietary people on then she has like movie people on then musicians are on it's just all over the place um so it's a great show to check out i i don't um but anyway so i'm i was going to say something else but i think i'm going to leave that alone um so let's go so anyways that that's the end of the show um i'll talk to you guys later thanks for listening and bye